Hi everyone, I'm Eugene, I use he, him pronouns. I'm Thomas, I use he or they pronouns. And we are here from UCSB doing Strike Syllabus Week 5. Direct Action Gets the Goods, Labor Organizing and History. And on that note, um, this is Direct Action Gets the Goods, but also this is the Direct to Video special because this is just us recording with no one and they're going to post it. So exciting. We've gotten to um, that um, part of exclusivity and um, just general awareness where no one wants to watch. Here we go. It's like The Handmaid's Tale. Hulu is exclusive. This is a um, stream exclusive. No live, no theatrical release for us. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, to start off, uh, we, for the past few weeks, have been talking about a specific set of things, and we're now going to transition into a little bit of a different register, close to a little bit of a review where we've been so far. Um, we've spent the first few weeks examining some of the structural and social issues that have brought us to our current moment. Obviously, the most sort of pronounced among those in our, right now is COVID-19, but we've also talked about housing issues state of funding of higher ed, profit center university, which I capitalized for no reason, and disaster capitalism. It's just some of the kind of big things that have structured our society and the way we're experiencing things right now. Um, last week, when we heard about disaster capitalism, the kind of our last note of our doom and gloom section of this, we talked about how crises have been used to push through neoliberal anti-democratic change. Um, but we also mentioned that disasters create opportunities for people power. And so we're gonna to pivot to some of that in the next couple of weeks and talking about models of how people have resisted um, different forms of oppression or affected change that have benefited the zip people. And then we have a graphic. Do you want to talk about the graphic at all? No? Yeah. Um, I just, uh, I found this. I thought since, I mean, COVID really um, is the, like, why, part of why we're doing this and everything is happening. So, I mean, just like in everything we're reading, right, wash your hands and then don't be racist and xenophobic. <laughs> all, of the, all of the language that surrounds the, the virus and the response to it has been in within this vein. So if you can do those two things, you'll better world, better world. So now we're taking a very hard left. This is a completely like um, egomaniacal project fueled only by my love of myself and hatred of everyone else. Um, about medieval history, um, just look at some example, because we talk about disaster capitalism and response to the disaster. We talked about it very much in like the modern sort of US context or even sort of modern world context. Um, I think it's important to think about some other examples from history to show that disease has led to social change in a lot of different contexts. And that as much as we feel limited or oppressed by neoliberal structures, we are not without options. And it's not something that, and it's, these are issues people face in the past and overcome. So I want to think about disease and social change in a different historical context of the plague, um, the medieval plague. Uh, the plague affected Eurasia and North Africa between 1347 and 1351 and wiped out nearly 50% of populations in Western Europe. So it's a very different scale of disease spread than we're talking about right now during COVID, but it's been something that people have been sort of talking about a little bit, about comparisons of parallels. So I'm going to draw out a few, um, some parallels between the plague and COVID-19 in terms of its social impact, um, is that minority groups, specifically Jews, were, scapego were scapegoated in a lot of Western Europe and became targets of violence and sort of conspiracy theories. Um, some fringe groups, specifically one called flagellants, took part in very spectacle-laden social demonstrations. They'd whip themselves and um, kind of say it was God punishing us, different than the protesters that we see today who are standing with guns in front of city halls, but still very fringe and very kind of spectacle-oriented. Um, and additionally, and more substantially, the disease fundamentally restructured the organization of labor and prompted social change. So here's a beautiful image Eugene found, um, 17th century depiction of the plague in jolly old England, <laughs> um, England, um, because I'm gonna be talking about England specifically, even though the plague affected all parts of people throughout Europe, Asia, and North Africa, I wanna talk specifically about England. And something called the Peasants' Revolts, which we'll get to, happened in 1381. But for context, England was impacted by the plague in 1348. That's when it first started to really get hit by it. And much of the rural working population of laborers and serfs was wiped out by the plague. Um, most of the population lived in rural centers and produced goods that were then imported into the city. And all this workforce got um, unfortunately sick and died during the plague. And as a result, demand for labor surged and laborers could all of a sudden negotiate higher wages and better contract terms 
um, than they could before, and their purchasing power increased. So this is a very different situation, whereas before workers were very dependent on the terms set by their lords, or uh, serfs were dependent on their lords, or workers were dependent on their employers, so the terms for things, now they had more bargaining power and more room to sort of make their worth known because there were fewer laborers working. And this is as far as purchasing power between 1340s and 1380s, laborers' purchasing power increased by 40%. So it was a really, as much as it was a tragedy for the many people who died, for the working class that survived, it created a lot of opportunity um, to sort of reclaim and reestablish their worth and their place in society. In England, lawmakers did not like this increased power among workers and passed a couple of bills in 1349 and 1351, still thinking about 1348 as so a start date, pretty quickly, within like one and two years um, after the plague hit England, they introduced legislation to stop what's happening among workers. So they tried to fix wages at pre-plague levels. They tried to set a cap on how much wages um, workers could earn. They criminalized workers who refused to work and who wanted to break existing contracts. They said, if your Lord offers you a contract, you have to accept it and you can't break the ones you're currently in. You can't negotiate for better terms and you can't look for different work on different sort of, on different Lord's lands. You have to kind of maintain what was happening before. Trying to maintain normalcy, if you will, was what the lawmakers were trying to do. There were also some temporary laws passed that were restricting the kinds of garments that laboring class people could buy. So not exactly a thing we see right now, um, but there was a, a fear that working class was getting too much money and too much ability to pass themselves off as higher class. So that was also restricted. So just a lot of restrictive legislation passed against workers. As this was all going on, not unlike our own situation in the Imperial United States of America, um, English officials were continuing to raise taxes on everyone, but especially lower classes, to support war, a foreign war. Um, so the Hundred Years' War was going on, and the English were not doing well. They were issuing more and more taxes on everyone, some affected the rich more than the poor, which we don't see a lot of now, but some of them were flat across all classes to keep funding at war efforts. So people were feeling kind of pressed. The obvious alignment of royal officials with landowners' interests was very unpopular among laborers in a way it hadn't been before. The uh, lawmakers should not taken so obviously a pro-landowning um, stance in their legislation as they had in the kind of years following the Black Death or the plague. Um, and so, in the context of these changes and sort of restrictive measures that were being implemented by lawmakers, um, workers began taking a set of actions to resist what was happening. So in 1377, workers began refusing work requests on their lords. They were just saying no to offers that were issued, and they appealed to courts to defend their decision. So this is one kind of type of action that can be sort of think about, that they refused um, to comply with their lord's wishes, and when their lord tried to retaliate, they turned to courts to try to uh, defend themselves. They were not successful in court often. The courts usually side with landowners. Um, that's something to keep track of or just be mindful of. But in 1380, a new kind of sort of action started taking place where workers' protests started to break out across Northern England specifically. Um, they were protesting new wartime taxes. They were sort of rioting in response to new taxes that were being introduced. And they were forcibly removed some officials from office. They kind of like would literally like drive them out of like town in a very medieval way um, and sort of do violent things as well. Um, and this all kind of came to a head with a Peasant Revolt, which is dated in 1381. It started in June 1381 when royal officials were sent to investigate lack of payment of poll tax in Essex. I really worded this the worst way possible. But royal officials were sent to Essex to investigate uh, underpayment of taxes. As they, they, thought. they thought they were not, the taxes weren't paid in full. The village representative said that Essex had paid all the taxes it was going to pay and it was not going to pay anymore. And it seemed like the, the villagers were sort of ready for a confrontation because many of them were said to have been armed with weapons at this meeting, being aware that this would not be received well by royal officials. And sure enough, royal officials attempted to arrest villagers um, representative and his um, assistance and protests or retaliatory violence ensured. Some officials escaped, but some were killed um, in this. Um, and from there, the Essex rebels began moving southward towards London and rallied support and other villages along the way, which is like a rich and colored history. You can look up this, uh, elsewhere, but the point is they go to London. And so that was in June, it began, and by July, rebels stormed the Tower of London, began looting royal paraphernalia and executing corrupt officials. Um, these raids were led by a woman named Johanna Ferrer and her husband, which is just sort of an, an interesting um, fact. 
and they demanded a bunch of changes to laws and new protections for workers that the king issued. Oh my God, excuse me. However, um, in the end, after the revolt simmered down and the people had been executed and some of the movements had been suppressed by the kings, many of the rebels' demands ultimately were not met. Um, and the issue, the laws that had been declared during the revolt were retracted. So not exactly a stunning victory, but um, in the aftermath of the revolt, Parliament abandoned pursuing further poll taxes and cut back their war effort. They announced that they were not going to be able, they were not going to continue funding the war to the same degree that they had before, and they're not going to issue new taxes that effect. So there's one kind of immediate direct change that happened as a result. Um, there were also some, this is a little more ephemeral, but in later years, um, workers would contest the sort of requests of their lords or landowners and would cite the revolt as kind of their support for why they were not going to do this. And landowners did gradually start to increase wages, partly out of fear of revolt. It was something that got mentioned a lot in later years. It's something that motivated or informed people's decisions. And this is just one of also many um, workers' revolts in Europe to follow the plague, which is, I spelled wrong, um, which is still great for me. But there's other examples such as in Italy, a Chompy revolt, that one's a little less um, connected, but similar suppression of wages um, leading to results. So there were many workers and like common um, rebellions in this period. And so why do we care? Well, people are talking about it right now. Um, Eugene can vouch for this. I had this idea like on Thursday of last week, but on Sunday, yesterday, um, Salon.com published an article, like an op-ed thing, the Black Death led to the demise of feudalism. Did this pandemic have a similar effect? So people are thinking about these connections, thinking about the ways in which pandemic fundamentally alters the structures of labor and goods distribution, but also the Peasants' Revolt is an example of a direct action in times of crisis, which is sort of direct action, sort of what we're talking about today. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Thomas is a historian. I don't know if you knew, uh, and I love everything that he brings to these case studies. That was really exciting. Um, so we're going to pivot here to talk about more of like contemporary things. Um, but we want to start and kind of end with what's happening with COVID because I think that's important um, and something we're facing directly right now. Um, if you are from the future and you're looking back watching this, this permanent document in the archives of uh, things, things might have changed. But for right now, what we can see is that in the US, risk of exposure to COVID is explicitly distributed across class. So <clears throat> this new category of essential workers are ones who are be are people that just months ago were becoming redundant through automation. So be like robots are replacing their jobs uh, and had been thought about as being disposable. The, the talk in this country has always been that those low skill jobs should be low pay, should be by the like the youth people or the margins of society because no one would actually want those jobs. And now we can see that um, the, these are the people that are actually making our society continue to function. The other thing is that while we're talking about, while the like 45 is talking about it being like the Chinese disease, which we'll get into in a second, um, actually vectors of the disease have been shown to come through global business flights. Yes, Tom. Yeah. I just want to know, and I saw that New York Times thing a couple weeks ago, that in New York, it was introduced from European tourists who were there. Yep. Yeah, and they've actually have charts where they're showing like the, the vectors of the disease are, are like going lots of different places and there's at least seven or eight like vector sites of where the disease has traveled from. So um, when we're thinking about global things, it's often hard to show a singularity. There are multiple things happening. It is a giant connected world. But one thing to note is that this is spread by elite travel. It is not like that is something very specific. Um, it is also distributed across race. So like in the US right now, we are seeing a curve flattening happening for wealthy whites. That is not happening for black and brown people. They are dying at higher rates. And we know that our healthcare system is already unfairly um, discriminatory uh, toward black and brown people. And it's just being exacerbated. We're also seeing increased racism against Asians not just Chinese people, but Asians in general, because they all get lumped together in our, in our, like, in our 
communal zeitgeist. So there's also that these rates of COVID are, is like wildfire among prison populations. Faster than any other country in the world right now, prisoners are being infected with the disease. Um, so in light of this, I think this particularly applies to our, um, our strike at the UCs is that working from home, our living conditions are our working conditions. And like the UC does not acknowledge this, will not, because then they have to extend all of these things to our, um, us working from home. Um, and beyond us, th the amount of people working from home who are not covered by insurance in specific ways, they're so not getting extra money for working from home, things like that. Um, also that our workplace now, so our houses, are at the mercy of tools that are, uh, that are run by monopolies like internet connections. Um, with, that is not a fair market. <laughs> they are mon internet monopolies. I don't know what you mean, Eugene. I love Zoom. I love Mr. Zoom. I think he's doing great things. <laughs> yeah, all of these individual tech things like are lots of people are going to benefit from this, which is great, but they are not equally distributed and it's not equal access in any way. Um, we are also seeing changes happen that are going towards authoritarianism. So Viktor Orban in Hungary is declared like an authoritarian state. We're seeing lockdowns happening without safety nets. So in in India, they had just the, this, uh, like, everyone stay home or you'll get arrested, and they have migrants and, like, transient workers that were not cared for. Small businesses are not getting the loans that they require because bigger corporations are taking them. Yes, Thomas. Well, I know, also, just to bring even more home, elections um, are not being allowed to move by mail so that you have to risk your health in order to vote, which well, is a strategic thing that Republicans wanted to do so they could get their guy in the Supreme Court in Wisconsin. So. Yeah. Uh, New York just canceled their primaries because, uh, yeah, because Joe Biden's the only candidate, so they just canceled it, which he, at this point, Bernie suspended his campaign, so that's just a whole other thing, yeah. So, I mean, elections are being compromised by this. Um, it's wild, and this is what's happening now. So, Thomas was talking about direct action, and so we kind of want to define what, what the heck what the hey is direct action. So direct action in a quote is that, um, and this is from uh, beautifultrouble.org, we take collective action to change our circumstances without handling our power to a middle person. Smart direct action assesses power dynamics and finds a way to shift them. So often people think direct action is like protesting or like throwing rocks at stuff. Um, but there's actually a lot of different types of direct action that we can, we can point to. Similarly, people think that direct action is civil disobedience, that you're like doing something illegal. But that is, again, a type of direct action that doesn't necessarily um, come first. And so um, we can split direct action into like nonviolent and violent if we want to propose that binary. Um, where if we, we can think through historical examples of nonviolent direct action, um, and Gene Sharp um, published this pamphlet that is 198 Methods of Nonviolent Action, and in the slides, there's, I made it very small so that it fit, um, but there's a link to those 198 methods. But what those nonviolent direct actions include are things like formal statements to politicians, to corporations, to other people, wearing symbols of support, marches, doing teach-ins, that's what we're doing, uh, rent withholding, bo boycotts, any kinds of strikes, types of non-cooperations, and sit-ins are all forms of nonviolent protest and direct action. Violent um, direct action comes from, especially in anarchist circles, this idea of the propaganda of the deed, which is the idea that by doing these violent actions to protest the violence that is uh, 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 directed under classes, that you're igniting the spirit of revolt. So some of these things look like riots, bombings, stealing from your own job, um, vandalizing symbols of oppression, things like that that would be that are kind of if a continuum nonviolence and violence more on the aggressive side of things. Um, and did I want to say something? No, I have that later. Cool. So with this idea of direct action in mind, we wanted to 
bring some attention to what kind of labor organizing and direct actions are happening currently um, within this COVID crisis. So one thing to know, and that is happening before our eyes as, we, as we're speaking, is that companies are not providing adequate protection for their workers. So specific companies like Instacart, Whole Foods, and Target, have um, their workers have been complaining that they haven't been giving them any kind of protections and haven't been changing their business models to accommodate their workers um, and their health at the forefront, rather than just making more profits. Amazon, Smithfield Foods, and Tyson have done the same thing, but from like an industrial factory side. And on that note, just to bring us to your, back to your earlier point about um, xenophobia, those motherfuckers at Smithfield were trying to blame immigrants as the vectors of disease in their factories when their workers spoke out and said, no, here's the specific practices you were not observing to protect us. In those, and there's been, uh, was it Smithfield Foods? I, it might have been that another one, at least another company. Um, it was shown that it, it was actually their refusal to um, admit people who were already infected and made them go to work, even though they had the symptoms. So it's like, it becomes a scapegoating mission, which you could see from Thomas's um, presentation about the Black, the black Plague, um, that's always happening past, like trying to blame especially minoritized groups more than like your own business practices that are just profit driven. Um, in that same vein, hospitals have had gag orders on nurses and doctors um, for speaking out against their working conditions and the unavailability of PPE, the long hours, things like that. Um, so then uh, when thinking about this, Right now, workers have been organizing strikes and walkouts to protest these specific things and more. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg and we're really only talking about the US and a little bit of Europe. But like globally, this is having huge impacts that we aren't even touching on. So um, Amazon workers are currently organizing a sick out on May Day, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, to protest what's been happening at Amazon. Um, and do you want to get into this a little more, Thomas? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, for... sure. No, um, nurses and medical workers. Um, we saw like this over the past week, some kind of dramatic images of medical workers and scrubs facing down protesters and trucks who are like against social distancing. So they've been doing that kind of activity. But even from the earliest days of the um, COVID spread in the US, medical workers have been demonstrating nurses in New York um, were outside of their work uh, protesting for PPE early on in the days of the disease spread. Um, they have been organizing and talking about it very openly um, before hospitals started issuing gag orders. So it's been something they've been very engaged in from the front, or from the beginning, since they are sort of on the front lines of uh, what's happening. Um, back to Smithfield, who I'm like obsessed with, I just hate them, um, even though I don't even eat pork. But Smithfield workers, so partly in response, but um, to what the companies claim, they've been protesting and walking out of their jobs. And one employee filed a lawsuit against the corporation last week, claiming that it was endangering the safety and health of the community by not enforcing social distancing things, and then more. In, in Chile, what has been happening is that women are launching a feminist emergency plan that is coordinating caring duties and mutual support and mutual aid against gender-based violence, which has been since, uh, I think last year, have there have been mass uh, feminist protests uh, against gender-based violence throughout the country and other um, South American countries as well. People are also organizing rent strikes. You might be involved in a rent strike that's happening. Um, not only inability to pay, but also that it's just, it is a time when we should be thinking about more than just doing things as normal. Which leads us into May Day. May Day, uh, like for midsummer. <laughs> Having its origins in like a celebration of spring, it has become a, a symbol of labor organizing um, and a celebration of labor history. So we have some uh, some fun dates. Everyone loves a date. Uh, also so, just for content, like May Day is Friday. Like it's coming up. First of May, four days. Very timely stuff Eugene's doing here. 
so since 1886, anarchists, feminists, and other workers and rebels have observed May Day as a celebration of resistance. So the, the big spark of all of this is what is known as the Haymarket Affair, the Haymarket Massacre, where anarchist organizers Albert and Lucy Persons led 80,000 people down Chicago's Michigan Avenue in the first May Day Parade chanting eight hour day with no cut in pay. What happened is that Parson, both Parsons were put on basically a, a show trial that um, everyone at the time was like, this is wild. You're not even listening. It was uh, a really, um, it was just because they were like anarchists or socialists that they were like, they were put on trial in this way. And and after this march, over the next few days, 350,000 workers around the U.S. went on strike at 1,200 factories, including 70,000 in Chicago, 45,000 in New York, and 32,000 in Cincinnati. Jump to 1950 in South Africa. While black workers in South Africa had participated in major demonstrations since 1928, um, on this day in 1950, the Communist Party called for a May Day strike to protest against the Suppression of Communism Act. So you remember the Red Scare? Remember when everyone was getting called a socialist or a communist? This specific act was written in a way that anyone who opposed government policy could be deemed a communist and was very um, going to be targeted and, and was targeted toward black workers um, who were seeing um, these uh, race-based uh, laws and organizing happening against them. In 1968, in France, um, there was a huge conflict between students and authorities at the Paris University at Nanterre, I said that wrong, I'm sure, um, where more than 20,000 students, teachers, and supporters marched uh, on May Day. They had massive classes with the police, which started months of strikes and occupations that nearly toppled the French government. And 1968 is known as the long, hot summer. And this moment really precipitated strikes uh, worldwide. Uh, in the UC system, the, like, this is a direct corollary to protests that happened here about the Vietnam War um, all over the world. Uh, this was like an activating summer for protest movements. And then in 2012, um, there were powerful anarchist demonstrations around the world in Montreal, in Oakland, visiting Occupy sites a year prior to that, and Seattle, which echoed the 1999 WTO protest that um, happened in that city. Which gets us to May Day 2020. Um, here are a couple of quotes from Crime Think um, that I thought really echoed what May Day this year can be about, this transformative change. So the idea is that we make the economy. We can shut it down. We don't need stay-at-home orders for the false liberty of reopening the economy. We can decide together what is essential and how to care for everyone. Open a new world, not the economy. Also, our joyous acts of rebellion do not point to a world in which workers are paid a little better for their labor but to the possibility that we could sweep away all the forms of oppression that stand between us and the tremendous potential of our lives. And I think that is the goal that I think Thomas and I have had in doing these presentations and all the conversations we're hearing about May Day is that it's, we can't return to business as normal. We can't just go back to our old ways of thinking and our old ways of oppression. We need to move forward and be able to change things. So when thinking about May Day um, 2020, we found on genstrike.org this kind of 11 things that you could do to participate in May Day. Now, the first thing to think about with any direct action is that you should not do things alone. Um, all organizing is, is group focused. Uh, it doesn't always have to be mass groups of protesting, but that you get protection from the collective. And if, and working through COLA, all of our conversations is that like the more people that participated, the more protection you have and the more organized you could be. So when thinking about any kind of May Day organizing or any organizing in the future, you definitely want to join your fellow workers and coordinate for larger autonomous actions. So the easiest thing to do is to signal boost things. So Strike University is having week, the week-long 
uh, events around May Day. Every single day we're having events. So definitely participate in those. Um, all of our campuses are doing their own May Day events, um, culminating in probably what will be a car caravans on Friday. Yeah, where they're going to be zooming around, banging pots, protesting kind of these working conditions. The second thing you do is not buy anything. So if, if, if we are organizing for a labor strike, or sorry, if we are organizing to show the power of our labor, not participating in this economy is one way to do that. Another is by donating money, goods, and services to striking workers. So like we said earlier, the Amazon workers are going to be staging a sick out, donating money to them, supporting their cause, supporting mutual aid networks in general for four is a great way of doing this. Um, I know the like UCSB for COLA has its own mutual aid account. There's lots of organizations nationwide and worldwide that have mutual aid networks slowdowns so perhaps you are working and on friday but you can intentionally reduce your productivity to earn less money for your employer and that is a that is a you are working but you are working less so that there are you they see less profits another thing to do is a sick out so this works this is difficult if you don't get sick days but um this this is demonstrated it in uh, um, has, has worked in the past and continues to be a, a valuable method of organizing. You could demonstrate at work. So things like wearing a supporting t-shirt, a symbol, a badge, a hat while you are working that you could show your support for striking workers or for work stoppage. You could also uh, do a labor strike, which is one of the um, most like furthest direct actions that you can take. The strike is a, is a leverage um, and is one of the most powerful ones, but it's also very dangerous. So definitely make sure if you're striking in any way you coordinate with other people. We also have tenant organizing and rent striking, which is conversations happening nationwide. May 1st would be the when you have to pay your rent is due. So that is, it's also gonna be the focus of rent striking. Debt striking as well. So the financialization of the economy um, and with debt is that um, is a huge sticking point. In the US, the average adult has 6,000 in credit card debt. 32% um, of American workers have medical debt and over half have defaulted on it. So this is uh, a day to not pay your debt and to strike in support of that. Um, and there are lots of other ways, point 11, to think about for supporting uh, organizations. And I one thing in all of the research and reading that we've done about organizing efforts is that you wanna be able to support those most vulnerable populations, especially within this, uh, in COVID right now. So prisoners rights groups, immigrant detainee liberation groups, indigenous groups, homeless advocate groups, community food banks, disabled rights groups, LGBTQ plus rights groups, and other organizations that are helping people who are the most vulnerable regularly, but even more so now in COVID. Whew. My God, Anything my else? direct action king. <laughs> I'm ready. Just, just send me a text. I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Now, yeah, that, we had so much about direct action. This is kind of setting up, I think, some of what we're going to talk about in the next few weeks, um, looking at different types of direct action, different kinds of actions in general, both historically and kind of in the present. So next week, we're having the very um, straightforwardly named you neons and me neons and strike you and me, um, which I think speaks for itself. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about unions next week. We'll have a different title, maybe. Um, but next week we're talking a little bit about union history, union stuff now. I, you know, I always do history things, so we'll just kind of click and clack and click about unions. And um, maybe you didn't want to say why. We can wait till next week. But in terms of like, yeah, I think that um, what what's been happening with the coal movement is that we have put a lot of support and support and pressure, and they go hand in hand when talking about unions, um, behind our union, and um, what has been happening now is supporting a ULP strike, an un, uh, unfair labor practices strike. So I think 
it is very timely to talk about unions next week to talk about how they function, different types of them, the history and where we are now. And so we'll try to bring in some of the, what has been happening uh, in the UCs and in unions generally. Um, I'll talk about the very important context of what medieval Germans were doing to their sleep sheep herders. Um, Cause that also makes a lot of sense and be very important to talk about. Um, <laughs> You always bring in something exciting. I never know what, what's going to happen. It's so good. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. Until then. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Miss you. Miss you too. And.